Hello, my name is Santa Gardla. I'm from Michigan State University, and I want to talk to you today about telecollaboration. So here's the agenda for our short 15 to 20 minutes together. I'll give you an introduction, provide you with some definitions of what telecollaboration is, why you should try it, or I hope you will try it, some models of telecollaboration, learning outcomes that we have seen from the research um, uh, in telecollaboration projects, and then also best practices, meaning what are some guidelines, some hard lessons that we have learned that hopefully can help you have a good experience with telecollaboration. And then I'll also provide some resources at the end. So why am I talking to you? I have used telecollaboration in ESL as well as in German classes on all levels in a variety of formats and also supervised a few dissertations on this topic. So I feel like I can offer some practical as well as some theoretical and empirical perspective for you. So what is telecollaboration? Telecollaboration is really a friendship, right? The old pen pal system. So it's a partnership either between two individuals or a group or maybe even two classes that form whole class partnerships. These partnerships might be peers, they might be expert novice pairs where you might even switch the expert and novice role, or it might just be an expert who's always an, an expert. The main thing of telecollaboration, of course, is the communication. So somehow people communicate with each other. We used to write the letters, this is what my son is doing in French class, but we typically um, use email or other um, electronic formats. Typically in telecollaboration or just telecollaboration that I want to talk about are in some way about an additional language. So either all or some of the participants are using a language that is not the language that they grew up with. Because it's telecollaboration, it is virtual, meaning we might be using video conferencing or email or messengers or um, Skype calls, audio or video calls, any of those formats. It's goal driven. This is a really important piece. So not just letting um, students talk with each other, but actually give them something to accomplish as part of those conversations. So those are some elements of telecollaboration. Why should you introduce telecollaboration in your classes? I would say it's fun, but maybe some more specific reasons are um, it's one way to provide the students with an opportunity to have meaningful communications. So we don't get a lot of time with them in classes in the typical US foreign language class. This is a way for them to have more meaningful communications and thereby improve their language skills. It introduces them to a community of practice. They are now part of this community of people who use language X, whatever that language is, which is a lot harder for them to imagine if they're just in a classroom setting. It has real world relevance, right? They're communicating for a real purpose with other people. And it's a change of pace. I think that's what the students appreciate most. It's away from the textbook. It's just something different that can be, can be fun. And it's a connection to a greater community, especially if we're working with partner schools in another country, the country of where the language is spoken that the students are learning. It's a first step in the direction, or can be a first step in the direction of working with that community. But there are some cautions. It is not that easy. Most importantly, it's incredibly time consuming. It takes a very long time to set up partnership. And I'll later tell you some ways of making that less time consuming. But that's one issue. The second issue with time is that our schedules often don't align with partner institutions in um, countries where we would like to collaborate. So technology, anytime we use technology, of course, there is the risk that technology can fail. So the best way to approach it is to offer a variety of venues, a variety of tools that students can use to interact with their, with their partners. And then also, if it is a graded component of your course, making sure that you account for that in your grading criteria, that technology just can fail sometimes. And then there's the aspect that here there are humans involved and sometimes humans don't respond. So again, if this is a graded component of your class and your students are supposed to write five emails and their partner never writes back, it becomes a very different kind of interaction than if their partner actually writes back and the students can't control that. 
And of course, then there's always the potential for misunderstandings and um, intercultural communication issues. And that actually is a great piece where you can then integrate it back into the course with some reflection, and we'll talk more about that in a bit. So I want to just present a few models for you. These are not the only ones. There's a lot more, but these are some that um, cover the grounds, I would say. The grandmother of all um, telecollaboration projects in the US is probably a Cultura project, which was developed at and um, that is a project where US and French students work together and they shared and discussed in class aspects and then with the partner class. And the whole premise is a compare and contrast format. How is this in France? How is this in Germany? And it goes from a little bit closer to the person to further and further away. So they start with um, filling out questionnaires and then they go to data on polls and facts about France and the US. Then they look at artifacts like films, images, then contemporary news stories, and then they go into scholarship to look further um, from an academic perspective how these two cultures are being presented. And the online discussion forums, the students are all are discussing, and it's always in their first language. So that's different from a lot of other projects where the students are being asked to either switch languages or go in their non-native language. Again, like I mentioned, my son is doing a pen pal project with France, and he actually has to write in French, and his French partner has to write in English. But in the Cultura project, the students are producing in their first language, and so they're exposed to the other people's languages. And then they have L1 and L2 small group video calls as well. It's about a semester long. And what's really great about this project is that the platform is open to others, so you can also use these materials and um, you can also see some of the interactions. So if you want to not do your own interactions, but analyze with your students interactions that have happened elsewhere, you can work with, with this platform, which is a great resource. Then um, another project was done by Teresa Schenke here at uh, Michigan State University. She's now at Yale. Um, it was, it's, a, again, a very typical partnership in the sense that it's beginning, beginning German learners um, at US college working together with advanced English learners in German at a high school. The reason why she worked with the high school is because the uh, schedules match better between the high school and college here. But of course, then we did have the age difference, which wasn't as, as pretty as um, it can be when we have more equivalent in age. They were working in one-on-one um, -on -one partnerships and discussed variety of topics. I put them on the slide here. They're related to culture and stereotypes. So how how's my culture seen? How is your culture seen? How do we see each other? They discuss these topics via email and English with their partner because this was a very beginning German class. And then they had a few whole class video meetings. Important here again is that there were also reflections that the US students did in class to sort of unpack their experience. And it lasted for six weeks. The reason why I included this um, example is because the tasks are actually included in the article. So again, if you don't want to create your own task, you could just work with the ones that Teresa has provided. Another example is what three colleagues in German did, Nika Arnold, Laura Ducate, and Claudia Kost, who are at three different North American institutions, and they worked with intermediate German learners who were reading a novel, the same novel, in their respective classes, and they were tasked to collaboratively, collaboratively create background resources for reading the novel. So some historic information. They worked in groups of two to four from either just one institution or multiple universities. So they were bigger teams that then contributed to this wiki and teachers and peers provided feedback. It lasted three to seven weeks depending on the institution. So what I like about this project is that um, it's peers, they're all learners of German. So we don't always have to go outside uh, the US or Canada to find partners. We can actually find partners within our country and then the time conflict can be a lot easier and, and the language levels are closer together. And yet it is exciting because there's people outside of our own class. Another interesting project was done by Joe Cunningham at Georgetown. He worked with advanced German learners who were enrolled in a business German class and they were having a module learning about entrepreneurship. 
And um, during that module, they analyzed interviews and learned about the genre interview. And in teams of two to three, then interviewed entrepreneurs from Berlin at the end of the module. This happened in video conferences. And the preparation was about four weeks, but then the actual telecollaboration part, the true telecollaboration part, was really just the one interview. So this is an example of how you can do something small and yet get a lot out of it for your students. Another example is teacher training. Originally, I wanted to bring in a different example here, but I liked this one when I started reading it, so um, I'm going to give you two in one. So the typical way that we see teacher training and telecollaboration is typically that students are, um, my, for example, my students are learning German here, and then some German pre-service teachers in Germany are telecollaborating with my class and they're developing activities for my students and my learners. So they're gaining the teaching experience and my students are getting extra learning help in a sense. This is a little bit different, this teacher training example. Um, here we have Polish and German pre-service English teachers that work together to discuss cultural topics. Um, and they discuss them both in their respective classes, but then also together. And then they decided on one topic and in a multi, well, different groups decided on different topics and then in multinational um, groups work together to create a project based on that interest. And interesting here is something that I really appreciate in telecollaboration is that the students were allowed to use a variety of digital tools so that they could work with what worked best for them. And so again, this is an article with an interesting list of tools if you wanted to look at it. And it has eight weeks, um, it was an eight week project. I'm going to now talk about um, one project as two projects. So it's the same telecollaboration, but presented um, from two different angles. I'm gonna first start out with Kylie Dasolsky, who is, he did her dissertation here at Michigan State University. So this was a telecollaboration that we conducted here. It was between a advanced German class and a class of pre-service English teachers in our study abroad destination in Freiburg. So they worked together. They had to complete a variety of discussion tasks that were related to the topics of the course. So very closely related to our courses. And the, the, myself and the partner instructor worked very closely to make sure that the assignments we were giving the readings we were giving were close, as closely related as we could make it given the requirements of our universities. The students also completed a reflective blog that was only visible to their peers at home. So there they could unpack again if they ran into any kind of intercultural communication issues or something that surprised them or just sharing and seeing is this just my partner or is this typical of the experience of Germans. And then they also wrote a research paper analyzing the exchange. They again were allowed to use any format of technology that they wished. Our only requirement was that they should aim for speaking 50% in German and 50% in English so that both sides could benefit from the language learning experience. How they divided it up was up to them as well. And it happened during the second half of the US semester to account for the difference in um, university schedule. So what Carly Dazowski looked at was the partnerships between heritage language learners and um, the Germans in Freiburg. In the German program, which is different from maybe an Arabic program or a Spanish program, we typically don't have a lot of heritage language learners, or at least not enough to have a separate track for them, but we do have several of them in each of our classes. And we typically have a hard time finding a way to really accommodate them and their needs. And this was a great way of doing so. So the heritage language learners could really navigate their identity and who they are and how much are they like a German and how much are they like an American and what does it mean to be in this in, in between space um, and really built on it. So for them, it was an incredibly helpful experience. The real reason why we introduced this project in this fourth year course was because we wanted to find a way to entice more students to go abroad and at the same time also help students unpack study abroad. So that's why we deliberately chose as our telecollaboration partner our year-long study abroad site so that students who hadn't yet been abroad 
could see, oh, this is a really nice place. I'm not scared. I could go there. And I already have a first friend, which is indeed what happened. So some students, they needed that extra con uh, connection to feel comfortable going on a year-long study abroad. At the same time, we often find our students that are returning from year-long abroad having a hard time reintegrating into our curriculum, struggling with reverse culture shock, and a lot of other aspects. So this was a nice way for them to transition back to because they could keep their Freiburg personality and start being back with their East Lansing personality. So it worked really well in terms of keeping connections alive, creating new connections, and navigating this space of, ooh, I am now an international person. Another model that, again, as I said in the beginning, time consuming to set up tailored collaboration, one way to work around that is to work with a pay model. So for example, Talk Abroad is a provider that offers native speaker conversation partners. And as a teacher, you can set up the tasks that the students are supposed to complete with this native speaker. So in this case, it was used US learners of Italian and a teacher set up four tasks for them to complete with the native speaker who was paid by Talk Abroad. And then they also had to do some reflection tasks you see again the importance of unpacking the experience of the interaction. And it was done via video chat, like you see in the example here from Talk Abroad. And they did it four times during the semester. What I really liked about this article is that it has some really nice practical tips of how you can implement Talk Abroad. Again, we have used it here as well in some of our online classes, um, but it is an additional cost. So there's always weighing, is it, is it worth it? There's a gain for me because I don't have to set it up, but at the same time, it's a cost that I'm passing on to the students. So what do students gain from a telecollaboration? Well, they develop their language skills, be it for pragmatic skills, overall language proficiency, they get that interaction, they get the feedback, they get the output, the input, everything is in there, they can develop that. It's also a great way to develop the intercultural communicative competence, as I mentioned earlier with the heritage language learners and then the um, education abroad returnees, it is a great way of working through identity issues related to being a language learner and user. It's a connection to another community of language, of speakers of that language. It gives them a sense of community. I am not just a student in German 101, but I am a part of learners of German, learners of Arabic, learners of Hindi, whatever it might be. And also it's a motivation. We see a lot of times students when they get an opportunity to communicate for real purposes with real people from communities where the language they're learning is a dominant language, they feel energized and they wanna keep going. So that's our way of, of keeping them going. So here are some tips that we've learned from over the years of working with telecollaboration. First off, plan significant time to set up the partnership. The earlier you start, the better. And create tasks that are open and are based on a common material. So maybe they have both read the same novel or they look at the same survey and the task is open enough so that they can take it in different directions, but still is directly connected to something so they're not just sitting there staring at each other and don't know what they should be talking about. Give room for both factual and personal exchanges. We looked in the beginning at um, Cultura and Cultura very purposefully tries to not have the personal piece. We have seen in our students that we have a lot of students who want that so we want to give them both and then each pair can decide which piece they want to do, um, spend more time on, whether they want to spend more time on the factual discussions or more on their personal experiences. We also found it extremely helpful to provide students with communication tips. This might seem a little silly, but we have learned that, that students didn't know how to do small talk, for example, in the target language, and they didn't know how to build that connection to the other person. So we gave them tips like, listen to the recording of the previous session and ask three follow-up questions at the beginning of your next session so that they really are building connections there. 
we should already suggest it using familiar technology. So what is easily accessible for your students in the context that they're in and also for the partners and what are technologies that they feel comfortable with. And a really important piece is to integrate these tasks into your course, both in terms of preparing the students for engaging in these tasks, as well as unpacking them and reflecting about them and their communication uh, after they have completed the task. You should create grading criteria that take into consideration a non-responsive partner, as well as technology challenges. I mentioned that in the beginning. If you want it to be a graded component, make sure those grading criteria are flexible. And then set parameters for the students or give them the tools to negotiate parameters, such as what tool are we going to use for this interaction? Which language are we going to use? When are we going to use which language? And when are we going to have our next meeting? This was one of the things that failed in a lot of our pairs that at the end of their you know, task number two, they didn't make a plan for when they would talk again. So that's an important piece because otherwise task three might never happen. So those are just some tips for the future. Here are some resources for you. Um, I have listed a few websites where you can find um, partnerships or tasks for partnerships. And then on the other side, you see all the articles that I have referenced here. Of course, there is much more literature about telecollaboration. I just wanted to highlight a few that hopefully showed you a diversity of what can be done with a telecollaboration. So thank you very much for listening. And if you have any further question, my email is right on here. I'd be always happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you and enjoy telecooperation.